Well, good morning. Some of you are thinking, I hear a voice, but I don't see anybody. I'm over, over here this morning. It's just uh, one last transition as we begin today. Hey, I just want to welcome you to North Park Community Church. I'm Pastor Zach. I'm one of the pastors here, along with Pastor Luke, who will be uh, preaching today. We're just glad that we're all here. Um, it's hard to believe that's already been two weeks since Easter. Uh, it was just such a fun weekend for us, and I'm um, enjoying our, our recently freshened up space with the painting and such, and more of that to come. It's just, just good to be together and see so many full chairs. This is always fun to see from up here. Um, very quickly, if you guys haven't picked up one of these, um, I encourage you to do so. It's just a, a list of all the things that are going on in the next couple months. And I'm not going to necessarily tell you what each thing is in detail. I'm just going to tell you kind of what they are and encourage you to read um, the information on your own. Um, so just really, really quickly here, all these things. Uh, the next two Sundays, um, we have our um, our membership class, our, our getting to know North Park classes. Um, it's something that's required for membership, if you've been interested in membership here, along with baptism. Um, so the, ne the next two Sundays, that's going to be available during the, the 9 o'clock hour here. Um, that'll be led by Pastor Luke, so I'll make, that, make you aware of that. On... Um, May 5th, related to membership, is a, a baptism service. Um, we have an individual here who has expressed interest in being baptized, and whenever that happens, we tend to open it up for anybody um, who's interested in baptism. Um, um, so we encourage you, if you are interested in that, to come talk to one of us, the elders. Um, we'd love to talk to you about that. Um, it is a requirement for, for membership here. On uh, May 12th, um, like Pastor Luke said recently, we have had a lot of families expanding this, this fall and this winter. Um, so on May 12th, we're going to have a very full uh, platform up here with all of our families who are interested in dedicating their children um, to the church, to the Lord, discipling. Um, so if you're interested in having your family participate in that, uh, feel free to, to let us know that as well. Um, on the men's and the women's ministry side of things, on the 28th, the ladies are having their favorite things event, and I do not know what that is. I've never been to it, but it sounds fun, and I'm sure the food's great, um, but I encourage you to, to read about that and sign up for that. It's April 28th on a Sunday, the women's favorite thing. But what I do know about, though, is men's group. Uh, men's RDM is resuming this Thursday at either 6 a.m. or I think it's 7 p.m. They're identical sessions. But I just want to make you, make you aware that men's ministry is resuming this Thursday for our next session. So that's the, the main things. There's definitely more. Um, and we don't do a lot of things just to be a busy church, but it's just really a response to all the really wonderful, wonderful things God has been doing in our church. And we want to be faithful in serving him and just continuing to be a community as he's, he's designed us to be. Um, my last quick note is you might have noticed a table in the back. Um, there's a family in our church who... Uh, very generously dropped off um, a surplus from a, a distribution center of food, and it's just all on that back table there. There's um, some nachos, some pretzels, some salsa, a lot of coffee. And it's kind of that stuff that legally has to have an expiration date, but we know it's good for, I don't know, two, three years maybe, because it's what it is. So feel free to peruse that at your own risk. We're not liable for anything, um, but there's some, but some, but there are some really, and staff's already, sorry. So just enjoy that as you, as you please. Uh, so with that, I'm going to invite the team forward for the music. And as they do so, I invite you to turn to the third letter of John. You can read it in your own text, in your own Bible, or the words will be on the screen. And today we are concluding uh, just a wonderful series through the letters of John. And though this one is short, um, there's definitely a lot of really neat things um, that John probably had no idea would continue to be read and understood and processed uh, 2,000 years later. So we're going to read this as our opening passage, and then we'll, we'll go into some music today. Third letter of John, all 15 verses here. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, 
who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God, for they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we, am, we may be fellow workers for the truth. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, um, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So, if I come, I will bring up what he, has, what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers, and also stops those who want to, and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whatever does, whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, each of them by name. Let's pray over this as we set our minds and our hearts on our Lord today. Lord, we thank you for the power of your word. And I'm sure John had no idea um, how much impact his simple letters would, would be for the church so that we could see it today and see just a glimpse of what the church was going through then and um, how much of the same issues are, are here today just because of sin and struggles and hardship, Lord. Lord, we thank you for not just your servant John, but for all of our uh, forefathers who have um, worked to preserve your truth uh, throughout history, through thousands of years already, Lord. Just the power of your sovereignty and your, your ability to preserve the things you set in place and to maintain your control and your, your authority. Lord, I pray today that we would um, approach you uh, because of the grace you've given us. Thank you for making a way for us to come before you through your son Christ, his shed blood, his resurrection. Uh, it's by his name alone that we can come to you today to worship. So, Lord, please accept what we have to give to you. Uh, thank you for your grace and mercy to us again. May you be pleased with our time today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand? We're going to sing today.
Testament often describes uh, the Lord as the God who will go before us. This is a quick passage from Deuteronomy 31. This is the words of Moses in his last days before passing the reins of Israel to the servant Joshua. Uh, this is what Moses says to Joshua about the Lord. He says, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. Then he says, It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. And that's what this next hymn is about. Oh 
Good morning, church. I am Pastor Luke, if you're newer visiting this morning, and as Zach mentioned, um, I have the sweet privilege of bringing uh, the message to us on most Sundays. And as we often uh, set on our minds, um, either at the beginning of our service or at some point throughout, we just like to make note of how good and how pleasant it is when God's people dwell in concert together, in harmony and unity, in the fellowship of King Jesus. It is a sweet and a blessed thing that's going on right now. This morning, as we are wrapping up our series through the letters of the Apostle John, finishing third John here, uh, before we go any further, I just want to pause and I just want to give us a minute for quiet reflection after some time, I'll close us in prayer, but take a moment now in the stillness of your soul to be with your Father as we prepare to hear his word. Our God, Father, we ask that you would calm and quiet our souls within us. Lord, we ask that you would open our ears and that you would give us eyes to see, that you would incline our hearts and our minds to your truth, that we would be a transformed people, a people set apart, different in this world, a light set in darkness. Father, we ask that you would so transform us, that you would shape us to the image of Jesus, our Savior, so that as the world sees the way that we live, they would yearn to know the God we worship. Be exalted in this time. We pray it in the name of Christ, our King. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> long, long ago, there was a prince. This prince was incredibly wealthy. He spent his days enjoying his life of luxury. He had 
three different palaces that he would rotate through with each season. And this prince fell in love with a beautiful young woman, and their love and their romance was the capstone to a perfect life. One day, the prince realized that he knew nothing of the world outside of his palaces. He knew nothing of the common people outside of his walls, and out of curiosity, he ventured out into the world. As he walked through the streets, his eyes were opened. He saw the grotesque reality of how the world really is. It was all laid bare before him in suffering and pain. He saw hungry mouths and he saw sick bodies and his world was forever shaken. The prince could not return home to his life of luxury in the ignorance to the world around him. And so, he left his riches, he left the woman he loved, and he wandered out to try to understand the world that he lived in and what life was all about in a world filled with such suffering. As he ventured out and began to contemplate the world, his mind was enlightened. And he realized that all suffering in this world is ultimately a result of our attachment to this world stemming from our desires within us. Every joy and every sorrow that we experience is a result of desiring someone or something, whether it be the love of our life, whether it be the prosperity of our children, or our own bodily well-being, or whether it be riches or comfort and pleasure. As long as we have desires within us, we will experience suffering and will never experience the best version of life. So said the enlightened prince. Therefore, the goal of life and the only way to experience true inner peace and serenity of soul is to unattach yourself from everything, to terminate all desires within you. Then and only then will you establish harmony in your being and be freed from suffering. The prince who came to these conclusions, his name was Siddhartha Gautama. And he is the founder of the fourth largest religion in the world known as Buddhism. I have a number of difficulties with, with the Buddhist worldview and the philosophy of life, including, no shocker, a deep enjoyment of a good meal, but more importantly, a deep attachment to my family. And to you. We were made with desires. And we were designed for attachment. That is what love is. Love is a committing yourself to another for their good. And love is risky. And it brings about the potential of suffering. But in the Christian worldview, the goal of life is not to remove suffering, but to love God and love neighbor through suffering. The presence of desires within us reflect how we were created and designed by God. God, in his kindness to us, gave us faculties to interpret goodness and beauty. The problem is not that we have desires. But, according to Augustine, the problem is that we have disordered desires. 
when we downgrade love and devotion to God and how we live, when we downgrade lives of sacrifice and service for the good of others, when we elevate personal comfort and pursuit of pleasure in how we order our lives, we disorder our desires. Now, if our, if our desires are rightly ordered, we will find the joy we were designed to experience. But if our desires become disordered, joy will only be a carrot dangling in front of us that we will never ultimately catch. The truth of the matter is, what we value most will be what we desire most. And what we desire most will be what we try to find our joy in most. And as we look at 3 John, running throughout these verses, we find that our joy is tied directly to what we value most. Our joy is directly tied to what we value most. And to make the point, we have three portraits in this short letter. Perhaps we could call them three micro-character studies that teach us something about the joyful life that we were designed for. And the first portrait is the portrait of Gaius. Let me start out by maybe describing what Gaius and the church looks like today. Today's Gaiuses are the people who are constantly looking for ways to bless others. On the surface, it might look like picking up the tab, inviting you over for a meal, opening their home to someone passing through, or writing checks and sneaking gift cards in envelopes to visiting missionaries or people in the church who have just gone through some difficulty. That's just what you see on the surface of these modern-day Gaiuses. But what occurs alongside these acts of generosity and hospitality is a laboring to bless. It involves fellowship, listening and encouraging. It includes prayer and it has service, restraining no effort to bring rejuvenation to the soul that they're ministering to. When you come to Gaius's house, you're met with a warm welcome. Your coat is taken and hung. You're whisked to a comfy chair. You're given something to drink and you're engaged by a humility that seems only concerned with you. You're provided a meal that is a clear labor of love. You're prayed over. And when you leave, you are filled with joy. That's what it looks like to encounter a modern-day Gaius. But let's turn our attention to 3 John and see how the apostle describes him. Verse 1, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. John opens his letter in a characteristic way. I hope by now, going through 1 John, 2 John, and now 3 John, we're starting to pick up on some of the characteristic attributes of John's writings. This brother loves the people he's writing to. He loves them in the truth. To Gaius, my love in the truth. Beloved, verse 2, I pray that all may go well with you, that you may be in good health, as it goes well with your soul. This is a, a, a kind of a common introduction in Greco-Roman first century letter writing. But there's something unique in it, in the way that John elevates the quality of his soul as more significant than his physical well-being. But he prays that his physical well-being would, would match the quality of his interior life. And then he goes on, 
For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. This is a letter of joy. I rejoiced. I have no greater joy. This is a letter from John to Gaius, from spiritual father to spiritual son. And the apostle is simply filled with joy because of the news that he's receiving is to the praise of Gaius' life of faith and love. This is parental language. That should spark something within those who have children in this room. Maybe you've had a kid go off to college And you can recall a time when you got a letter or a phone call of how something went well. They passed a major exam. They got into the program that they wanted, whatever it is. They're being selected for another level of education afterwards. Like you get excited, don't you, for your kids? I can tell you that I cherish good reports about my boys. Yes, about their academics, but more so about their quality of goodness in their lives. I have a vision and a goal for them to become good men, better men than I myself am. And when I hear news that they have taken a step in that direction, it fills my heart with joy. Too often, I think we tend to rejoice a little bit more over the worldly things that go well. Things that aren't wrong in and of themselves, but things that are nevertheless not eternal. But John's joy over Gaius is one that is based on Gaius' life looking like Jesus' life. And there's a lesson for all of us in the family of God, regardless of if you have kids or not, about what we value and rejoice in amongst one another. And then John starts to get into the specifics here. Look at verse 5. This is the report that he heard. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all of your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testify to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. Look at this. Look at this. this is a faithful thing. This is in step with the faith. What it, the, the efforts you give for the brothers. Gaius gives labor, effort, time, energy. He is not passive in his love. His love is expressed in outward service to others, even though they're strangers. He doesn't know a thing about these guys, except they come with Christ as their Savior. And therefore, they've got an eternal bond together. They're in the family of God together. And he says, come, brother, and be refreshed in my home. Put your feet up and relax. Let me take care of you for a moment. These, these strangers, uh, they're, they're traveling teachers and, and evangelists, proclaiming the good news of Jesus and carrying apostolic teachings to the communities of faith, expanding all over the Roman Empire. The church is just getting establ- established. It's young. And as these traveling evangelists report to John, about their travels, about what they experienced out there. When, when, when they come and say, John, it's brutal in some places. We got driven out over here. We got beaten over here. But then we came to Gaius' house. And he, he mended our wounds. He said we could stay as long as we needed to. He fed us. He warmed us. He held nothing back from us. And John is hearing this and it's just tears. You can just imagine it, tears, as he hears of how Gaius is loving the brothers. He goes on to say, you continue treating them in the manner worthy of God, loving them and serving them as if you were loving and serving Christ himself. Because these have gone out for the sake of the name, not accepting anything from the Gentiles. They've gone out for the name. This is, this is a, a Jewish Christian thing here. 
For the Jews that recognize Jesus as Messiah, the name, that, that was a big deal. Hashem in Hebrew. The name, the name that you don't say out, out loud, Yahweh. Too sacred, too holy. So they just called it the name. These guys are going out on behalf of the name, proclaiming the name and proclaiming Christ as the name incarnate. And because they are proclaiming this new news that is so good, they are heralding it, proclaiming it. They want to make sure that they don't get associated with any other proclaimer of a worldview or a philosophy or whatever. And those guys were numerous. The Greek philosophers, the Stoics, the Epicureans, all these guys are out here and what they would do is they would come into the marketplace, into a public place, and they would start telling you a better version of how to understand life and, and to live a, a good life, to live wisely in life to live successfully in life. And people would start to kind of listen to them and kind of, kind of cling to them and become their students. And people would say, I, I want to know more about how to live this good life. I, 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 want, I want to receive more, so let me pay you a little bit and you give me some more instruction and my life will be better. We got a nice little transaction. And there were different philosophies out there and not wanting to be associated with just another philosophy, these traveling evangelists and teachers refuse to take assent from the Gentiles. They in no way want to be thought of as only in it for the paycheck. They're doing it to proclaim the way of life, the way of salvation, the gospel of Jesus. And they do not want to be mistaken for peddlers of just another philosophy. This is why Paul is a tent maker on the side. He receives gifts from Philippi and other churches, but he won't take it from Gentiles. Don Carson, as he looks at this in, in one of his lectures, as he comments on, on John's now call to support people like these, this is what he says. He says, I've sat by too many deathbeds and I've officiated too many funerals for children. You can't pay me for that. You can only support me in what I do as called by God. Brothers and sisters, there are missionaries around the world who have sacrificed first world comforts and the blessing of being in proximity to family for the sake of the gospel. And there's not a paycheck that matches their sacrifice. There are pastors leading groups of followers of Christ in underground house churches, risking their very lives for the sake of the gospel. There are men and women who have traded life trajectories that could have led to significant financial prosperity in order to minister to those who have been abused, oppressed, and outcast, all for the sake of the gospel. There's not a paycheck that matches the sacrifice they've given. But we can partner with them, and we can support them, and we can help ease the burden that they've taken on. I have a friend who is a retired missionary. He gave up an office on Fifth Avenue to become a missionary to an indigenous tribe in the Amazon of Brazil. And he spent 30 years ministering to this tribe with the gospel. And early on, his three-year-old daughter was bitten by a poisonous snake, and because they were so remote, they could not get medical help. And she died. Is there a paycheck for that? that matches that sacrifice? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But we can come alongside and support. And that's, it's such a value to us here at North Park to support missionaries, to support those doing good work for the gospel. And we will continue to keep that a priority. And we will look for ways to expand that priority as we move forward. There are also brothers and sisters living faithful and quiet lives amongst us 
who are injecting the gospel into their workplaces and neighborhood boards and schools and in their living rooms as they use something like golf as a way to gain access into a neighbor's life. And these subtler forms of gospel living also need encouragement and refreshment. They need to receive hospitality and they need to be blessed by faithful brothers and sisters in Christ who support one another as we become a network of encouraging and supporting. You go out, I support you. I go out, you support me. And it's this beautiful interconnection amongst ourselves that expands in our community for the gospel of Christ. That's the beautiful portrait. I hope you hear that and you say, that is compelling. That's the model of Gaius. Unfortunately, there's portrait number two. And it's not as encouraging. Portrait number two is the portrait of Diotrephes. Diotrephes in the church today was a man who probably started out well. He may have always been a bit cold. But he was never questioned for his commitment to the church. He shows up regularly. He's got certain leadership credentials and seems effective in helping move the ministry forward. He might even have a reputation for tenacity against heretical teachings and may even, uh, and, and, and even certain Christian teachers that he thinks have maybe gone off track a little bit. He has no problem calling them out. He may very well consider himself a guardian of the faith. The modern-day Diotrephes, being a natural-born leader, rises to places of power in the church, on the elder team, as a deacon, chairing a particular committee, or something of the sort. After some time, he becomes a primary influencer in the life of the church. Perhaps he's even on the pastoral staff. And now, because he has authority in the church, You're either with him or you're against him. It's either his way or the highway. You either get on the bus or the bus will run you over. And for the diatrophies in the church today, rather than having a reputation of love and care like Gaius, people tend to fear diatrophies not wanting to get on his bad side or finding themselves in conflict with him. For too many churches, good people have been driven away from the church because of leadership like Diotrephes. Here's how John describes it in verse 9. Beloved, oh, excuse me, I have written something to the church. I sent you a message. But Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I'll bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. John says, I already wrote you guys something, but Diotrephes apparently did not recognize the authority of John over him as an apostle. And John says it in the plural, meaning there is some collection of leaders who oversee the churches. Maybe this is a reference to the apostles, or maybe the, 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 the planting church, the elders of the planting church that planted where Diotrephes has, has taken over. It could be something like that. But regardless, Diotrephes does not recognize it. Even worse, not only does Diotrephes ignore the counsel of the apostle John, he actually goes even further to discredit him and slander him and to slander John's name to the people, talking wicked nonsense. Diotrephes, he likes to put himself first. How easy it is to shift from doing things for God to doing things for oneself and using God to get my way and to justify my own decisions. Such an easy shift in leadership. All too common. 
And what he's leading the church to do is to refuse these traveling preachers and evangelists, the ones that Gaius put up and blessed. He's refusing to minister to them. This may be because he believes that everybody's a heretic, like the deceivers that are warned about in 2 John, that if you're going from door to door, you must be Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon or something, but nope. The warning is there in 2 John. We talked about that last week, that they're out there. It may be that he fears all of them, and so he says no to all of them. But he's not called so much guardian of the truth here that makes me think that that's not exactly why he's doing what he's doing. It could also be that Diotrephes doesn't like other teachings coming in that rivals his teachings. Maybe he likes to keep the corner market on the power of this church. Maybe he doesn't like the tithes and the offerings being distributed outside of us. Let's keep the money in my account. We don't know, but we do know that it's all flowing from a heart that puts himself first. And perhaps the most concerning leadership move that he makes is that he kicks out the people who disagree with him and who wanted to support these evangelists like Gaius. And these people in the first century, we've mentioned this before, they were dependent on the community of the church. They risked so much. They were ostracized from, from, from in, in political sectors and, and, and in, in job sectors. You don't get to be a part of trade unions that worship these Greco-Roman gods if you're a Christ follower. And so you needed the church. They needed one another. To get kicked out of the church was a terrible thing. It might be sending them off to suffering themselves. But if you disagree with diatrophies... You're next. You don't cross diatrophies. I'm hesitant to use names, but this one is so public and out there and so much has been written and long-form journalistic podcasts have been done by Christianity Today on the situation that is just so prevalent that it, it... I'll go there. But there is a young, brash preacher who spoke in such a way that young guys like myself said, oh yeah, that's right. That's right. Say it. Give me more of that, Mark Driscoll. And early on, I collected his books. I listened to all of his sermons. I ate up everything that came from him. And as I look at those years, I learned a ton and I was not becoming a good person. And his ministry fell apart because different accountability groups were brought in to try to deal with the authoritative, domineering, oppressive leadership model, and he would not hear it. Wise, seasoned counselors like Paul Tripp were rejected. And so much hurt came as a result in the way the whole thing came crashing down. And it is sad. It is sad how some people have walked away from the church because they said, if that's Christianity, I don't think I want that. I got hurt. There's too many stories like this. There's too many stories like this. That's not a new phenomenon. It's been around. Because I think within us, the human heart, sinfully, when it gets a little power, it just wants a little bit more. And no one man was meant to have that much power. That's why God, in his good design for the church, has a plurality, a plurality of men who keep each other in humble submission to Jesus and to one another. That's Demetrius, or that's uh, Diotrephes. But John, he blesses us by not ending on that negative note. He gives us something else. He gives us just, just a little bit about this guy, Demetrius, just a little bit, just to give us something positive here. Thanks, John. 
That's not how I wanted to end my message with Diotrephes. So, Demetrius, in our local church today, he might not have a lot that's said about him specifically, but the point is that Demetrius is less about uh, the specifics of what he's done and more about the reputation that he's garnered. The Demetriuses of today are men and women who, whenever you meet someone who knows Demetrius, like, hey, hey, oh, you're from this church? Do you know Demetrius? (sighs) Smiles come on faces. Yeah, I know him. He's such a good guy. Yes, let me, let me tell you the story about like when I was in this pickle and like he just showed up and helped me out. I, I had this need right here and he was just there. I didn't even really know him that well. And you find that, that all these people seem to know this guy named Demetrius. And every time you meet someone who knows him, they're just like, oh, yeah, Demetrius, I love him. That's what we have going on here. Today's Demetrius is press back the darkness of evil in this world because they are more than just, quote unquote, nice guys. The goodness that they bring is in the name of Jesus. So it loves beyond niceness. It sacrifices and it serves. It blesses. It draws near where, there, where others refuse. It contends when others falter. It uplifts the failing. It strengthens the weak. And it encourages and exhorts those who are stalled out and idle. Here's how John Puts it, beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. A little bit of a transition from what we saw with Diotrephes and the evil. Don't imitate that, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius, he's received a good testimony. He's got a testimony. He's got a story people talk about that's marked by goodness. He's received a good testimony from from everyone. Everyone, I'm yet to meet somebody that doesn't have a good testimony about Demetrius. Not only only that, from the truth itself. The gospel that he goes around and preaches and says is the way of salvation, like he actually lives it. He actually lives it out like a transformed person into a nature of love. The example, that's what it's supposed to look like, Demetrius. And he says, John says, we also add our testimony and you know that our testimony is true. You know you can count it. When we, when, when we vetted it, you can trust it. And John's doing this threefold witness that says, take it to the bank. Everyone, the truth itself, we ourselves. Wherever Demetrius goes, there is a fingerprint of goodness that he leaves behind. What a beautiful, what a beautiful reputation. I had lunch this past week with Ron Scarf. Many of you know him. He's come and he's filled our pulpit before on a number of occasions. I didn't know him that well. I sat down with him. I said, Ron, this is so important to me that we have this lunch because everybody I talk to at North Park who knows you, they smile. They say, oh, Ron, what a guy. I said, I want to get to know you. He seems to to, to have more than good teaching when he fills our pulpit. There's something about it where you can just discern it in his very presence. This is a guy who loves Jesus and he loves the people around him. When I think about the different examples that could come to mind that represent modern day Demetriuses, not exclusively, but they tend to be older. And they tend to be weathered in the type of way that James talks about in chapter 1, where he talks about a faith that's been refined by various trials. I think this tends to be the case for a couple of reasons. One, a reputation like this takes time. Planted in a community, blessing those around you. I can think of a lot of younger Demetriuses in the making, But this type of threefold acknowledgement is not something that is quickly attained. This is long-term commitment at work. And then number two, a reputation like this is a mark of maturity, which also takes time. 
Maturity comes when we know where our ultimate priorities belong and, and we have the discipline to live for our professed priorities. We don't just say them out loud, we actually choose them in our day-to-day -day actions when opportunities show themselves. And these priorities are the priorities of a life that is lived in worship to God, love for neighbor. But it takes time for souls to let go of the things that we hold on to in this world. There's a lot of things that we naturally want to want to hold close. Financial success and comfy retirement, the applause of people, the accrual of pleasures, etc. But the process of sanctification or being conformed so that our lives look like how Jesus lived is this long process of reorienting what we value, things that have become disordered, and learning that what God has said is true about how to live the best life. And it takes a while to learn that I am not the best captain of my soul. And gaining this type of reputation is a testimony of a life that is being well-lived for the glory of Jesus. So the question that is out there is, what's the reputation that you have? And have you thought about it much? If you're on the older end of the spectrum represented in this room, have you considered what legacy you're leaving behind? And are you okay with what that is? If you're on the younger end and are living more for your resume virtues than your eulogy virtues, this is a, a designation that I caught from one author who observed that many of us, especially in our younger years when we're just in the throes of our professional careers and things like that, we, we spend most of our time and effort engaged in the things that look good on a resume while few of those accomplishments will ever be noted at our funeral. Rather, we ought to live for the things that will be said when we're gone. These are the things of real substance. And so as the music team comes back up, let me return to my original primary statement from this message. Our joy is directly tied to what we value most. We described, we depicted three different porches, but could, portraits, but could you feel the tone of each one of these stories in the very writing of John? Do you sense the correlation between the language that John uses and joy-filled lives? Joy on John's behalf and joy in Gaius and Demetrius' lives. Demetrius has a good testimony from everyone on how he lives. The gospel message itself attests to the goodness in his life. And I know it. There's no greater joy than to see him walking in it. Gaius John rejoices greatly over what he's heard. His life of hospitality and service gives me no greater joy. These brothers testify of your love. And Diotrephes, who puts himself first, does not recognize our authority. He speaks evil against those who are in the family of God. He does not welcome, rather he kicks those out. Joy isn't expressed in each one of their stories, but it becomes clear that joy in the kingdom of God never comes when I try to grab it and pull it. It comes when I set my own joy aside and I actually live to bring joy and blessing into the lives of those around me. In the upside down way of the kingdom of Jesus, it's actually when I forget my own joy and pursue the joy of others that I actually find the joy God designed me for. God des desires your joy. He wants you to have it. He's shown us how we were designed to experience it. Through lives of selfless love to the glory of King Jesus who set the ultimate example for us. That's it. That's the aim. And it is good. Let's pray. Our God and Father, Lord, we worship you. We worship you. Your word is a gift. We want to worship you, Lord, in more than just our words. We want your words to penetrate into our hearts 
to change our souls, to transform our lives so that we would be people of love. Love in the way we live lives of worship as we proclaim your goodness and lives of love for the good of the church and the good of our neighbors around us. May we see the model of Gaius and the model of Demetrius and may we step into that. Lord, help us all to be honest enough with ourselves to recognize that the heart of diatrophies is within all of us. It's the heart of pride. And no one in this room has slain that beast. But the beauty of the gospel is that you are in this process, Lord, of, of, of suppressing that pride heart within us and cultivating increasingly hearts of goodness and love that look like Jesus, the ultimate example. So transform us, Lord. We ask that you would transform us through the short yet powerful letter from the Apostle John. Transform us not individually, alone, but corporately as a local body. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word, and we pray this in the name of King Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please stand. We're going to respond to the hymn, "'Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus." May he prove himself over and over in our lives.
The Lord bless you and keep you, church. May he make his good and kind face smile upon you and uplift his countenance upon you. May his spirit fill you and lead you. May his spirit guard you and guide you as you go from this place as the light of the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I love you, church. God bless.